for Geekiness. Jay here, and today we're going to talk about my budget smart gunner build. Alright, now that I've taken a load off, and I can finally sit down after slaying some Xenos, uh, let's, let's lay out a few disclaimers for this video. Now, you know, when you start throwing around words like budget, right, like what does that really mean? Um, I dropped about $200 or so on this project. So, your budget may or may not be different, right? Uh, it is a budget build compared to people who are making their smart guns out of authentic uh, Kawasaki motorcycle parts and rummaging around through uh, old, old toy bins and whatever to find the little parts that go in, in the eyepiece and um, you know, going out and buying a $2,000 uh, vintage Steadicam uh, harnesses, it can add up really, really quickly if you're trying to make your smart gunner screen accurate to the movie um, with authentic found parts that were used in the original props. That can very easily uh, go well over well over 10 times what I spent on this project. So my build is a budget build. Your build might be different. And so we're going to go through each of the elements of this costume, talk about a little bit about what its lineage was in terms of how you could try to make these things more accurate. And we'll also talk about ways that maybe you could do these things that wouldn't include the same uh, cash outlay that I put into this. So it's also that, that number I threw out there is my best estimate of what I've spent on this project. Um, I know that I put almost two kilograms of PLA filament into the smart gun itself and a whole bunch of the other props, but there's a lot of materials that we keep around the studio and around the shop as a matter of fact. Paints, primers, clear coats, PLA filament, epoxy, super glue, contact cement, EVA foam, like these are all things that we just we just keep in stock. And I've tried to do my best to include all of those in here in that number, but I'm sure I missed some. And <clears throat> there's a little bit of economy of scale in there too. When I buy a case of paint or primer and I say Actually, I didn't even put the paint and stuff in this project, but, uh, you know, the point is I might estimate exactly, I might try to estimate how much EVA foam I used for, for the, the chest plate here, but you're not going to be able to just go out and necessarily buy $2 of EVA foam. You're probably going to have to buy a pack that's going to cost more, etc., etc. So, that number... Yeah. It, it depends if, if this is the only project you're going to build and you're trying to come up with a number for it. Uh, take mine with a grain of salt. If you're stocking your studio or your shop for a number of different projects, there's probably a whole bunch of this stuff that you have on hand anyway and that you can just grab and use or that if you buy a whole bunch, you're going to use it later. The other thing that's kind of hidden in that cost is some of the tools that I have available to me here in our studio and in our shop. Things like the bandsaw, the drill press, the 3D printer, which was played a huge part in this project, uh, heat gun, it, the list goes on and on and on. If you have a studio or shop and you have these tools available to you already, then great. If this is what you're starting at, you're, you're trying to use this video as a template for your first project, there might be some tools that you need to run out and get, and that's going to be kind of hidden in your cost for this project too. Um, as I go through the different parts of this, uh, this costume, I'll talk about the tools that I've used, but we'll also talk about uh, other ways that you might be able to tackle that with less expensive tools. Another important disclaimer for this video. My build is based on the movie Aliens. I am trying to uh, while I'm not trying to necessarily be screen accurate to that movie here, I am not cosplaying 
Drake or Vasquez, I am using that and the tech manual that was published after that movie, referencing that movie's materials, as my touchstone for this project. Uh, there are other media out there around the colonial marines. There are video games, there are comic books, and if you're going to use those as your source material, there might be some things that you would do differently with this project. For me, that was my touchstone, and a lot of the decisions that I made in terms of how I designed something or how I changed something based on those original designs comes from that movie as my, as my, my baseline. And lastly, before I dive into all of this, if you've been following my update videos throughout this project, cool, then you're already one step ahead. But I figure now that this is the project completion video, it's probably going to be a whole bunch of people that just click on this and watch this video. So I may repeat some things that I mentioned in those update videos and project uh, status videos in the past. So sorry if I bore you, but please bear with me as we travel through uh, my Colonial Marine Smart Gunner. So like I said, my plan for this is to kind of start at the top and work my way down. Uh, we'll discuss the different parts of this costume, uh, what they're based on, the decisions that I made in terms of making them screen accurate or not screen accurate, why I made those creative decisions along the way, and you can take all of that with however much salt you like. Um, we'll start at the very, very top. Uh, actually, we won't. We'll start with the headset so I can take it off and then show you the hat, which would really be the top. So the headset. First, I need to unplug it from my vest. That was fun. And pull this off. So, in the movie, the smart gun headset is based off of a Raycon headset that was available in the mid to late 80s. Actually, even earlier than that. Um, the Smart Gunner's headset is the same headset that we see the other Marines, or all the Marines wear later once everyone starts pulling off their helmets. Everyone's walking around with just a headset on. Gorman has one from the beginning. The problem is, Raycon doesn't make that headset anymore. They don't even really make one that looks similar to it. And to make matters worse, the same headset was used in the set for the Millennium Falcon. So, not only are there aliens collectors who'd love to get their hands on one of those original headsets to add it to their costume if they don't feel like wearing a helmet, but there's a whole bunch of Star Wars collectors who would love to have them to say that they've got a head the headset that Han Solo or Chewbacca wore. Um, so when they do pop up, usually came out of somebody's collection or whatnot, uh, they can go for some some really crazy money. You can also there there are some kits. You can get a resin cast kit um, and along with some other parts, make a headset that is similar. It looks 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 identical to the original Raycon headset, but those can be pricey. There's only a couple people that make them anymore, and yeah. So instead, what I did is I took a pair of headphones. You can see them in there. They're a pair of Audio-Technica head headphones that were dead. They didn't function anymore. You might have something similar hanging around in your house. And I used that as the basis for my headset. Now, all the parts on this side are 3D printed. You can find resin cast versions of uh, these parts too, but I was able to find some STLs uh, from some helpful folks on the Alien Legacy forum, and I 3D printed these, and then had to go about figuring out how they would attach to this headset as opposed to the original Raycon. So that was fun. I also chose to make this wire not go directly into the vest like it does in the original, but to go into the ear cup here and then run this wire down. I figured 
you don't really want that wire hanging around way out here where it can get caught on things. You want that to be closer to our body. So I redesigned that. And ultimately, I decided this is the Mark VI headset. You know, Drake and Vasquez, they had the Mark IV. The Mark IV was, you know, it was fine. Like the camera could get glitchy. We saw Drake's get glitchy in the movie. But this was the upgraded Mark VI. On um, the other side, you know, I took the the ear cup off. I took a piece of aluminum tubing. I 3D printed a few other parts and voila, we have a boom mic. So, simple enough. All right. Besides the fact that this was built off the Raycon headset, we, we also know that there's a whole bunch of parts in here that went to some old Transformer toys, which, you know, if you can find them now, they're vintage. Yeah. 3D printing's the way to go uh, when we're looking at some of those really hard to find parts. Um, how could you do this cheaper? Well, I mean, you could opt to not do the headset, I've definitely seen plenty of people cosplay as a Colonial Marine Smart Gunner without the headset. Um, again, you know, this is built off an old set of headphones, so as long as you've got a set of headphones around that you're willing to kind of glue a few things to, you know, you could do some version of, of the headset on the cheap. Continuing to work our way down the hat. So, in the movie, Drake wears a Vietnam era jungle cap. It doesn't have this sizer here in the front. It's got a little bit more of a straight front panel to it. Um, and that's fine. That's not the standard issue cap anymore. There is a replacement to that. The Army, U.S. Army, uh, issued after that. They changed the model number, they really didn't change the look at all. And sometimes you can find that one at uh, your local Army-Navy store or online. Um, but when I went looking, that was like a $15 hat maybe. So I spent about half of that on a more modern operator cap, which has the fun little Velcro spots here and here as well. You know, that's the fun thing about building a smart gunner, is we and Colonial Marines in general, but the Smart Gunners, I think, even more so, is that there's a lot of personalization of gear. Um, a lot of people will swap stuff out. Uh, you know, Drake is the only one wearing a vest like this, which we'll get to in a minute. Um, you know, people are wearing those caps on and off, but once we actually get to the combat scenes, most of the Marines have helmets on. Um, so Drake's the only one who keeps his cap. Um, so yeah, I figured, why not just pick a different hat at half, half the price of the, uh, the screen accurate cap and, um, you know, with the fun Velcro on it, uh, you know, I had one of these lying around. Uh, we see, we see a, a normal stars and stripes on many of the Colonial Marine uniforms. And, you know, on Etsy, I was able to find the USCM patch for a couple bucks and, uh, yeah, I think it works just fine. Um, how would you how would you downgrade that even further? You could just skip the cap entirely, right? You don't need it. Um, all right, let's jump around a bit. Fingerless gloves. Both Drake and Vasquez wear the fingerless gloves, so it seemed to me like it was worth grabbing a pair. I think I found these on eBay for a couple bucks. Um, you could get away without them though, so totally up to you if you want to save a few bucks. All right, as we continue to work our way down, we have an important piece of gear, the chest plate. So. This one's fun. The original smart gun harness is based off of a Steadicam harness. 
the Steadicam vest and arm were both used for the smart gunners, for both Drake and Vasquez. So you could try to find a vintage Steadicam vest and arm. Good luck. Sometimes they pop up, sometimes some collectors have them. They usually go for about thousands of dollars if you can find them. Um, you could go with a more modern Steadicam vest and arm. Uh, those will run you a couple hundred bucks. Uh, the look is similar, or you could do what I did and build your own. So if you look around on the web, you'll find that there are plenty of very innovative uh, camera guys who figured out ways of building their own Steadicam arms. This one in particular is made out of PVC. So very inexpensive to make. Um, the PVC tubing goes in here, there's some springs inside here, and then these brackets I had to make myself uh, from aluminum. I'm gonna link below the, the individual whose video tutorial got me started down the road on this. I made a whole bunch of changes to his design as I went. Um, notably, for his, he let, put the springs on the outside of the arm, and I wanted to go with the inside uh, to go with a slightly more authentic look. So I had to cut some channels on the inside of that. Um, but he did. Per I did use his template to make these brackets, and that was invaluable. Um, I will probably come back at some point and maybe lengthen some of these arms from what he had originally suggested or what he had originally built his for because I'm taller than he is and these are a little short uh, when I want the gun in a full upright position. Um, the only other thing that I had to do was Mod, it was come up with a different way to mount the smart gun to the arm. So I think we'll come back to that when I talk about the smart gun. The other part is the vest itself, and that's where I had to refer a little bit more to the tech manual and a little bit more open interpretation of how this is supposed to function and how it's supposed to be designed. So the closest we see either Drake or Vasquez to being in just the Steadicam rig is in the armory scene, where Drake is, is loading up and preparing his smart gun. We have that, that iconic scene where both Drake and Vasquez are going, hur, hur, hur. Um, right? Like it's, it's been gifted like a thousand times. And you can see that there's straps and there's some padding and there's some straps and they've put that little armor plate here on the front fine once we get to once we get to Hadley's Hope and then the, and furthermore the hive scene we start to see where they have to have put more equipment on and I believe there's some some anecdotes about how much duct tape it took to, to put uh, Goldstein and Rolston in their getups uh, for those scenes. Uh, they were literally taped into those vests. Um, and, and there's some great stills where if you look at them closely enough in what little lighting there is, um, you can see how much of it is duct tape. I, I didn't want to just wear duct tape, so I kind of went back to the tech manual and I said, what is this designed to do? What can we infer from what we see in the movie about how this is supposed to function and how it's documented as being able to function? Um, we see two scenes in particular. Uh, when Drake is retreating towards the APC and he either runs out of ammo or his smart gun uh, fails in some way and he has to drop his harness and switch to the incinerator. And we see something similar after Vasquez shoots the xenomorph and Hicks 
cuts, up, cuts her out of her rig and drops it outside the APC so that they can slam the door shut. In both scenes, we see that the, smart, the combat harness for the smart gun is supposed to be something that can be quick released. The operator should be able to drop out of it quickly if there is a failure in the weapon system or some other reason why they need to cut weight and run. Um, there's no way you can do that with the steady cam vest the way it's designed. It takes a lot of time to get all the parts into place and the user strapped in and the whole nine yards. We do see from the tech manual that the two little bits that come up off the vest here are supposed to be quick release buckles. So rather than just put some sort of plastic thing here or design some foam thing that looks more like the what we see in the film, I actually put quick release buckles. Um, and I did so on the side as well. Now, we do see in the movie that there's a lot more padding under these straps in particular, but also under the side straps. Um, I thought about putting more padding in under there, but honestly I wanted more of the vest to be showing. I wanted you to be able to see these patches and stuff. Um, so I didn't want to obscure those, and that was a creative decision on my part. Oh right, and I spent so much time talking about the steady cam rig as being part of that armor plating, I forgot to describe how I made my own. So the chest plate itself is actually just a piece of the EVA foam, like, you know, floor mat kind of material. Um, and then two inch strapping and buckles. Pretty easy stuff to find. Uh, a couple coats of Plasti Dip gives that that nice outer coat, and we're good to go. Uh, I guess I could, should touch on my shoulder lamp back here real quickly too, before I pull this off. So, again, like, you can make a shoulder lamp it's made out of all kinds of really fun found parts. There's some sort of like security alarm box that hasn't been manufactured in 20 years and the handle comes from a, a flashlight and the lighting housing actually comes from a film light. Uh, you, you can source all of these parts. Some of them can be hard to find. Um, some of them can be expensive when you do uh, I think there is there is a resin kit. Actually, I know there's a resin kit um, that you can buy. Again, it can get pricey. Um, so again, I 3D printed it all. Um, and then I've wired a couple LEDs in here, put some diffusive film in there so that you don't just see two LEDs. So again, I cut down my cost on this significantly by 3D printing and assembling all of these parts. Um, I've seen a lot of cosplayers do without the shoulder lamp. Um, so if you were looking to cut your budget down even more, you could ditch it. Um, also, strapped to my vest is my knife. Made it, put, a, put a little sheath on there and duct tape that on. Ta-da! Now, yeah. Both Drake and Vasquez carry their Explorer knife in a, boot, in a boot holster. But I figure as the operator of a weapon like this, it's impossible to get to that knife while you still have your weapon functional. And if you needed this to cut yourself out of your harness because the buckle got jammed, or you need to cut yourself out of a harness uh, in dropship or something like that, how, how are you going to get to your knife if it's stuck to your belt and there's a giant machine gun in the way? So I strap mine to my vest. The knife itself, you can find these. You could go with a real knife if you wanted to, but I like going to conventions, so I 3D printed this one. There's a great one on Thingiverse. I'll link it below. I've linked it in the past when I did my update videos. Um, that is round tipped, so I painted the normal profile of the knife on, on there, so maybe it tracks a little bit more like, but whatever. Um, yeah, so this is plastic and it's round. There's no way you could hurt anybody with this. Convention security should not have any problem with a prop like this. And it's right there, easily accessible.
The last part of the combat harness is just as important as the arm itself, and that is the belt. Now for this, I took a pistol belt, U.S. Army surplus. I attached a piece of PVC to that, flattened that out. That becomes the uh, endpoint attachment for the arm onto my hip, and made a foam armor plate to go there. There is an ab plate. There are some good angled shots, like low angle uh, shots of Vasquez, where you can see that plate uh, during the hive battle. Um, it's also well noted in the tech manual diagrams. I'll like stick that right there so you can see what I'm talking about. All right, now that I've got that off, you can see my vest. Drake is the only one who wears a vest like this. He actually wears a U.S. Army surplus Vietnam era flak vest. Right? Those can be tricky to find nowadays, though. You know, this movie was made almost 40 years ago. Um, so I just went and found an OD vest, a whole bunch of pockets on it. They called it a Ranger vest. Um, and I found a couple patches, this Screaming Eagle patch and the Delta patch. We see these on all the Marines uh, equipment, or on their uniforms, I should say. Um, again, found them off the same Etsy seller that I got the patch for my hat from. Uh, you know, how could you, how could you do this differently? Um, you don't need the vest. You don't need the vest at all. That's a great segue into the uniform itself. Um, especially if you're doing a rifleman, you need the shirt and the pants uh, to be in a camo pattern that is screen accurate, close enough. Um, the camouflage pattern used in the movie was designed by James Cameron for the movie. It was printed in a limited run and it was never used anywhere else. So, yeah. Now, there are one or two people in the world, still, who have the rights, I think, to print that camo pattern. And they will happily sell you a uniform shirt and pants that are screen accurate. They will sell them to you for about $200 for the shirt and about $200 for the pants. That was outside my budget for this project. So, I found something that I thought was close enough. And this is a CP camo pattern. Um, there's a couple other camo patterns out in the world that if you can find them are close enough. Uh, I think there's a Polish camo pattern that people mentioned. Um, I had difficulty finding that nowadays though. Um, but I thought the CP was, was close enough. So rather than $200 for pants, I spent $25. Now, how could you bring that down even more? I don't know. Most BDU pants are going to run you somewhere in the $20 to $30 range, whether you're looking at the CP camo pattern like this or a woodland pattern. Uh, so the only way you could bring that down more would be if you had those pants already. Uh, if you've got better ideas, Put them in the comments below, because I'm not sure how you'd get around that one in this on, the, on a project like this. The last uniform bit is boots. I've got black boots, because I own black tactical boots. Now, again, this is one of those fun areas where we see that maybe smart gunners get a little more, more leeway in their uniforms, because Vasquez wears black boots. Drake, I'm pretty sure, is wearing the same green and black jungle boots that the rest of the Colonial Marines are wearing. So, I think you've got a choice there, either way. Uh, when I went looking, you could find a pair of modern era Vietnam jungle boots in the green and black pattern for about 40 bucks. So, if that's in your budget, you can grab those and they will be a perfect addition to your costume. If you happen to have some black tactical boots around for other costumes or projects, 
I think you're just fine getting away with those. I may eventually grab the jungle boots, but for now, I have the black ones, and that's what I'm going to keep using. Also, we're going to keep working our way down. Like I said before, my inspiration for this project was the movie. And I know, I think it's the video games do have the shin guards that we see on the riflemen. There's that armor that covers the shin. Um, and so I think I've seen some smart gunners add that too. Um, I think the reasoning why they didn't in the movie is that smart gunners have a heavy load and so it, wherever they can shed weight they do. So if there's, they don't need that extra armor they don't carry it. Same reason they don't have a helmet. Um, that's up to you if you want to do the shin guards or not. I opted not to. Uh, but I definitely did think about it, because I do like the look. Alright, now, what's a smart gunner without a smart gun? So, this is 99.9% .9 3D printed. As I mentioned earlier, this took about 1.5 kilograms of PLA filament and about 3 weeks to print out all the parts. Um, I then came back, epoxied everything together, smoothed stuff off, did a lot of sanding, etc, etc, etc. The only things in here that are not 3D printed, there is some metal reinforcing rod in this joint here, and especially this joint here for the uh, foregrip, and in this joint here for the back grip. Um, those are very thin spots in the model, and so I felt like they would benefit from having some metal reinforcing rods. Also, we've got these cables that come out of there and go into our battery and our headset plug. Um, these were actually some coaxial cable that I had laying around from some point back in the day when we had cable. So you might have things like that laying around uh, at home that you can use for your project. Oh right, I forgot the foam bike handle. If we were going to source this <laughs> from the original parts, let's see, we know that these come off of a Kawasaki motorcycle that hasn't been made in a long time. Uh, same thing with this control rod here. There's some debate about where the trigger uh, guard comes from. We know that the main body was a uh, decommissioned uh, MG42 German machine gun, World War II era. Yeah, you could try to find all of those parts. And there are definitely people out there who are, and more power to them. Um, it's a lot of pieces to try and find, and they're not necessarily inexpensive when you do find them. So for, for those that are building theirs from found parts, like, go you. Um, but I think that's out of many people's budgets. And if you're trying to throw this together in time for a particular event, it might be out of your time frame because all the parts don't necessarily show up right when you need them. So. I found a great, really good 3D model of the of the prop, and I cut it up into lots and lots of pieces, and I printed it. Uh, that worked on my timetable, and that worked with the tools and materials that I have, and that I work with a lot. If you don't have a 3D printer available, I've seen some pretty creative uh, interpretations of the smart gun. I feel like I've seen people pull them together with a lot of uh, less expensive or easily, more easily found, uh, found parts. So, you know, you build your smart gun uh, for you. Um, I'm pretty happy with how this came out. I mean, I could have spent a few more weeks, uh, you know, getting everything glass smooth or whatever, but I did not have time for that. And ultimately, at the end of the day, I'm still satisfied. Now. I said I was going to come back to it. So how does this attach to the mounting arm? So I've got a piece of PVC here, and there's a piece of PVC that I showed you on the arm 
that fits just inside this. So this is a joint that can pivot. I've cut some grooves there and there's grooves in the other one too so that I have about 270 degrees of rotation. Um, and then all the other articulation comes from the arm being able to pivot up and down, etc. Lastly, let's talk about the accessories because that's how you truly make this character yours, right? Smart gunners... <clears throat> Smart gunners seem to get some leeway in terms of what they need to carry. Neither Drake nor Vasquez have the two pouches on their belts that all the riflemen have. While everyone is carrying belt tools, neither Drake nor Vasquez do. I'm not sure that we ever see that Drake has a sidearm. We know that Vasquez does, though I'm going to come back to that in a sec. I mean, we see Vasquez use a hand welder in the movie, but it's pretty well accepted that she still stole Hudson's, because we never see her carry one, and by the time we see her using it, Hudson doesn't have his. So, yeah, there's not a lot that you need in terms of accessories for a Colonial Marine Smart Gunner. So, if you're on a budget, you can stop right there. You don't need any of these parts. but. I wanted some. So I made myself a hand welder. Again, 3D printed. And I did make myself two belt tools. Because everyone seems to have them. I don't know why Drake and Vasquez don't. What are they thinking? Um, interestingly, we do see that Vasquez carries two of something very similar to this, because if you take a close look at the profile of the belt tool, you will see that it is the same as the battery that she pulls out two of, hands one to Drake, and plugs the other one back into her smart gun after she has to relinquish her original one during before the hide battle. Last point on accessories that I was going to make is sidearms. Now, every Colonial Marine is issued a VP-70, it seems, because most of the Marines carry one. The exceptions to that are Vasquez, who carries a Smith & Wesson, and Hicks, who carries a shotgun. Now, where to put this? Well, I don't know. I mean, we never see where Drake carries his, if he even has one. Vasquez carries hers awkwardly in a holster strapped to her chest like this. I don't know that she can access that at all when the car combat harness is on. It would be a really awkward draw and you'd have to get your hand underneath the armor plate to get at it. It seems like that's only useful to her after she's cut the rig away and they're escaping from the hive. Which doesn't make sense to me. The smart gun is not particularly well suited to CQB. So it seems to me that that's exactly the kind of situation where a smart gun operator would want access to their sidearm. So I'm not going to put mine there. I'm not going to hide it away somewhere. I'm not going to tie it around my ankle or something like that. This actually goes in the small of my back. Um, and this holster itself was actually a really cheap holster that just came with a utility belt that had a whole bunch of pouches and stuff. But we didn't need the holster for that uh, costume, so this got tossed in a box. And then when I was like, gee, I need a holster for my VP-70, there it was. Um, so I'm sure you could find a holster like this for a few bucks somewhere on eBay or something like that if you wanted it. The VP-70 itself, 3D printed. Again, like so many other parts of this project. Um, I believe there's an airsoft version floating around out there that you can go find. Sure, go ahead if that's what you'd like to do. Um, but in my opinion, if you 3D print something and it is obviously an inert hunk of plastic, you are much likely to be able to, much more likely to be able to get it through convention security. Like I said, if you're trying to put together this costume yourself uh, on a budget, you could ditch it entirely.
Alright, I suppose the last thing that's worth talking about, too, is a creative decision that you'll need to take into consideration when you start a project like this. There's a big debate, olive drab or brown bass? And I, you, can, you can Google it. You can, you can search the web and find all kinds of discussions about whether the, you know, the pulse rifle or the various parts of the costume, the camouflage pattern itself, what color that should be. Obviously, I erred on the side of the, of the olive drab. You know, things like this are easier to find than the right shade of brown. And, honestly, I'm coming at it from the perspective of, right, James Cameron picked the brown best because he knew that under the very blue lighting that he was using to film under, that it would look olive. Especially since other parts, of, like the hat and the vest and stuff that, we, that Drake have, we know are supposed to be olive. But, you know, some people will argue very, very vehemently that things like, you know, the shoulder lamp and the pulse rifle and the hand welder and the motion tracker should all be painted in a color uh, that was made by a company called Humbrol, called Brown Bess, which they don't make anymore. So, again, it's another one of those you can either try to mix it up very carefully yourself or you're paying a lot for one of the handful of remaining uh, jars of this paint that have been, you know, at this point sitting on shelves for 30, 40 years. So, again, another consideration for your budget, but also for the creative direction of your costume. And that's it. That's this project in a nutshell. That's how I put together my Colonial Marine Smart Gunner on a budget. Put your comments below if you've got other ideas on how you could trim the cost of a project like this by even more. Um, I think the great thing about something like this is that, you know, there's some things that are open to interpretation. There are some things that you can move away from some screen accuracy on and some people will notice and a lot of people won't. But the reality is when you're walking around with a gigantic machine gun strapped to your hip, uh, in such a with such iconic parts of the, of the costume that people are used to seeing the the headset the gun itself that's what people are going to focus on and if you're missing little bits here and there or some little bits aren't a hundred percent accurate to whatever standard uh, someone might apply to it you know i think you've got some leeway so I hope you enjoyed this overview of my project and would love to hear your comments below. Till next time.